As the next speaker uh, and another highlight of this conference, I wasn't even sure if I need to introduce our next speaker. Actually, I will do since there is uh, not, not only techish people, but I think all the other communities as well will at least have heard about Dr. Paul Wixey. He is a CEO of Fairlight Security, and uh, okay, he earned his PhD from Kiyo University, was working on DNS, and actually he, he spent all his life on, on working on DNS, so he's author and co-author of numerous of RFCs, all related to DNS topics. Actually, he's the main author of Bind. What is Bind? So everything you type into your web browser works just because Bind works in the background. And uh, actually, uh, as a reward for all his work, he was also introduced into the Hall of Fame in the, the Internet Hall of Fame in 2014. Um, and he's also a world record holder. Guess what? He wrote the most third advisories as a single author. So today he, he will uh, introduce us his thoughts on uh, public policy aspect of the Internet race to the bottom. Paul, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, kind introduction. Um, I am not in the uh, military industrial complex, so I have very few uh, friends or customers among the military. Um, so it's a great honor for me to be asked to come here. I have some things that I want to share, uh, and they've been informed by the two speakers before me and the speakers yesterday. Um, and really what I'm hoping to do is to give you a different perspective on uh, what a low-skilled attacker uh, has available to them, and not just now, but in the future. So uh, let me begin with a story or two. Uh, I was part of the team who did the takedown for the Conficker worm in 2008. Uh, the worm actually was launched in 2008. The takedown was mostly 2009. And uh, my company still runs the sinkhole for the dregs of that worm. And when I say dregs, I mean that the, um, the high point in the population was 11 million infected computers, part of a single botnet, which I think was the record in 2009, by the way, uh, since been eclipsed. Uh, and by dregs, I mean that we're down to only one million unique IP addresses checking into the sinkhole every day now. So uh, that actually, although it's, uh, it sounds bad, is exemplary. When it comes to remediation of botnets, if you could get rid of 90% of it, uh, you're doing way better than average. Um, now, because remediation was so slow, uh, and because the people that want to work on this sort of thing tend to do it out of love more so than money. Uh, none of us was getting paid for this. Uh, passions ran hot, and uh, one of our guys who has an office in Atlanta decided that, uh, okay, nothing else is working, I'm going door to door now. So he found uh, a hospital in the greater Atlanta metro area, and he saw that they had a few dozen infected computers checking into the Conficker sinkhole every day. Uh, and he called them and he said, look, what's the deal? Uh, here's an IP address, here's a timestamp, here's a port number, here's you know, various identifying characteristics that would help the IT department that he was now on the phone with to identify which in, uh, part of the hospital was uh, you know, still infected. And it turned out to be a portable x-ray machine uh, in a surgical operating theater. Um, and he very quickly backed away and said, okay, it's a very good thing that we did not use our superior force to go and uh, force an upgrade and reboot of this potentially human life safety device. Um, and it made all of us wonder, what were the, 11, the other 11 million of these things doing? What part of our digital society uh, was now effectively depending on Conficker for part of its correct operation? Um, here's another story. Uh, my friend Stephen Savage at UC San Diego uh, bought a car, a Saturn, General Motors Saturn car, and he gave it to his students to play with, uh, and they eventually caused it to catch fire, so he had to get another one. Um, and without burning the second one up, they found a way that they could make an MP3 audio disc, so this is an audio disc you can play in the CD player that's in the, the dashboard of the, of the car, um, which if you play the fourth track had a deliberate encoding error 
which would then violate some of the assumptions and constraints of the CD player and send a control over the CAN bus of the car uh, to disable the brake controller. Um, now, what I, I bring this up not just because it's a funny story, but because uh, you'd like to think that if a car being sold for, I have no idea, let's assume 15 to 20,000 uh, dollars, uh, would have had some red teaming activity. Somebody would have looked at it and said, is there some way that we can do bad things to it? But the answer was no. Uh, the QA budget was all about did the seat belts work, not are these complicated digital systems that we're adding to this human life safety vehicle uh, making it so much less secure that we are a clear and present danger to, to history and society. Uh, they don't ask those questions. Um, so uh, I want to tell you why. I want to tell you what I think that means. Uh, so let's set the Wayback Machine for 1998. Uh, Paul Ferguson and Daniel Cini wrote uh, RFC 2267, it says here. It's usually known as BCP 38. And it simply said, gee, there's a problem. Uh, there's no admission control for packets. Uh, you can transmit a packet from any part of the internet to any other part of the internet where the source address can be forged. In other words, the packet can appear to come from somewhere other than where it really came from. Now, this was met with a bit of a yawn at the time. In 1998, it was not foreseen that the Internet would grow to be as large as it has, and even now it's small compared to the Internet of Things that we've just seen the, the numbers for, billions, uh, tens of billions of devices. Um, but it was also well known at that time uh, that there was no admission control for anything. You can send email claiming to be from somewhere else, and although a lot of companies, DKIM and so forth, that put a lot of effort into trying to secure that. It's still pretty much not secure, uh, blog comments, etc. So the idea that there was no admission control did not seem to be big news. Uh, now, I was a founding member of the ICANN Security and Stability Advisory Committee, and when Chairman Crocker asked the question, uh, what's the biggest unsolved problem in Internet security? Where, where is the biggest security and stability issue that we might be able to make a difference by publishing a report about, I raised my hand because no one else had any ideas, and I said, well, there's this thing. Uh, so I wrote the text you see here, which I won't read. Um, Ten years later, October of 2012, uh, the Security and Stability Advisory Committee, which still exists, by the way, I uh, got together in a bar somewhere at some ICANN meeting, I can't tell you where, I don't remember, um, and we all toasted the fact that in the 10 years since that report had been written, the problem had gotten noticeably worse, and the number of people who actually cared about it had gotten noticeably smaller. Um, so what does this mean? In other words, uh, sure, this is a technical problem, but what does it mean to us as defenders? Um, it means that if you want to send a denial-of-service attack to someone, uh, you don't have to do it in your own name. If you send an attack that is traceable to you, then it's possible that some of your apparatus as an attacker will be taken away. Uh, somebody will say that remediation needs to be done, and that will mean that you lose your toys. So uh, you really want it to be, if possible, that you can reflect your attack off of somebody else. Uh, and this is the perfect mechanism for doing so. So in this uh, diagram, uh, we're showing how an attacker, by sending a stream of packets toward a reflector, but forging the target's address on those packets can cause the reflector to answer the target directly. Uh, so I'll tell you what happens to the target. They say, uh, gee, I'm getting responses to questions I didn't ask. And they might call the reflector and say, could you please stop packet bombing me, right? You fill, you're filling up my internet connection. I can't get any real work done. It's uh, customer affecting, service affecting. Uh, life is bad. Can you help me? Uh, what the reflector might say is, well, I'm answering the queries I'm getting. They look like they're coming from you. Would you like me to stop answering any questions that look like they come from you? Now, if that reflector is someone you're not doing business with, you might say, yes, please. If, on the other hand, they are a very active name server, let's say they're a root name server or a server for .com or uh, you know, some other very busy, very necessary name server, then the target is not going to say, yes, please black hole me, because although that might make the attack stop, that is going to make their life uh, materially worse in other, other ways. So when I say here the target has no recourse, I sort of mean it. 
Um, the target does have some ways to invest in solutions. Uh, certainly as you go from any given enterprise toward the core of the internet, the pipes get fatter. And so if you can go far enough upstream that the pipe, the, the fatness of the pipe at that point is such that it's not being saturated by the attack, and then you can put some kind of filtering device there, you might have it be that the thinner pipes closer to you are thus not so congested that you can't get work done and serve your customers. Um, this is very expensive, and uh, certainly online gambling casinos all do it that way. A uh, huge source of revenue for Akamai and the other CDNs is protecting people whose uh, business gets them attacked all the time. Uh, but I think it's something you won't see every small to medium enterprise doing. You'll see a lot of large enterprises doing it, but for the most part, we're going to remain uh, vulnerable to this type of attack. As, and so, in my opinion, the real solution is that that attacker's ISP should uh, put in some very simple filtering logic. It's really unlikely that any of their equipment is so old that it does not have this feature. Uh, that might have been true in 2002, but it's not true in 2015 that they're still running equipment for, that's sort of too primitive to be able to filter this out. And the filter we'd like is just please don't allow packets to come from your customers that don't come from IP addresses that you've assigned to those customers. Simple solution. Uh, and unfortunately, it doesn't work. What that ISP is going to say is, uh, I appreciate how simple it would be, but I have other costs that go along with uh, installing it, right? I have to train my people. I have to set up uh, sort of a new procedure for um, connecting new customers. I have to change the diagnostic flowchart if something goes wrong and a customer is complaining. This is one more thing that might be the cause of it, so I have to make sure that this is part of our diagnostic uh, control procedure. Uh, so in other words, I have costs. You're not just asking me to walk down the street one time, or walk down the hallway one time, make one change and be done. Instead, you're saying that I should adopt a secure business practice that will have uh, some cost to me ongoing. It will have no benefit to me. It will not gain me any new customers. It will not save me any money. My customers are not the ones being attacked. So this doesn't do anything for me. It's just a cost. Uh, in fact, the benefit accrues to my competitor. The other ISPs are then going to be better able to serve their customers because I endured this cost on my end. Why is that a rational act? And indeed, I can tell you, since I've reported to more than one board of directors, that that is a difficult discussion to have. Um, so it turns out that all over the internet, uh, for both device makers and operators, uh, there is not any incentive for upfront security engineering. Uh, what you're trying to do is to get online as fast as you can so you can turn on sort of the, the, the revenue generators as fast as you can. Um, there's not a, a lot of incentive for monitoring your output. I mean, it's possible that complaints from people that are being bombarded by your customers because of this method uh, will some t maybe add a few support calls, and those calls represent a cost. Uh, but it's such a small cost, it's much easier to sweep it under the rug than to manage it. And um, there's, there's no way to candy coat this. This is the chemical polluter business model, where if you have an unregulated environment and you have uh, some sort of factory on the side of some river somewhere, uh, if they can take in clean water, uh, build profitable services and products out of it, and dump dirty water in, and the only problem is felt by people downstream of them, that seems like the rationally selfish thing for them to do. Um, and when I, I'm describing this as an unregulated environment because, at least in the United States, there are uh, regulatory bodies who are designed to say, you know, we're going to impose this cost across the industry, so you will not be less profitable than your competitors as a result of following certain rules. And we have to have those rules followed or the overall economy suffers, and, uh, and that's our role. Uh, but the Internet is intensely unregulated in that style. So uh, here we have a little bit of technical stuff. I know we have a couple of technical people in the audience. I'm not going to go march through this step by step, uh, but I will say that Torsten Holtz and uh, the rest of those authors really deserve uh, to have you go look up this paper and, and read it. Um, so everything that you do on the Internet uh, everything, certainly everything you do with the web browser uh, is currently done over TCP. 
Uh, and TCP is the transmission control protocol, protocol if you wanted to know. Uh, and the only reason any of this matters is that a connection begins with a, a sort of an advertisement, a desire to connect. You, you send a SYN packet, S-Y-N, and they will send you back a packet that acknowledges that and also sends from their end. Um, and this synchronization process, once it's complete, uh, it completely avoids all of the problems that you would have from IP source address spoofing. In other words, once you've exchanged a, a couple of SYN packets, then you know that the rest of the conversation is uh, authentic and it's coming from where it claims to be coming from uh, because you sort of swapped a couple of random numbers in that first uh, exchange of packets. Um, however, the first exchange of packets does not have that property. And um, it turns out that SYN packet that you're sending has a sequence number, and the rule in TCP is that if something has a sequence number and it doesn't get acknowledged, you have to retransmit it. And so, uh, same thing with the SYNAC. So, if I decided to send uh, every one of you a SYN packet, uh, and we were to have our lovely moderators uh, as the apparent source of those, so I forged a SYN packet at all of you, uh, you would each answer them with between three and 20 packets. Now, that, those would not be back-to-back -back packets, and so maybe that's a small enough number that it wouldn't take their, their link offline. Um, but I could send this, the, these packets to every connected server on the Internet, every web server, uh, every time server, every name server, every server uh, that I can reach, which is hundreds of millions, because uh, we, we survey this, so we know that answer. And if all of them were sending uh, three to 20 packets per minute toward a single person, then they would be offline, period, full stop, uh, because there is no way to filter these out on either end. Um, and this is built into the Internet. And the reason it's built into the Internet is because that got them out of the test lab and into production. And they, they did not have a red team saying, by the way, here's the way this could be misused. And since this was all done in the 70s and early 80s, uh, these assumptions are built into every device now connected. Um, so I don't know exactly how we're going to solve this, because going house to house isn't going to work. Uh, so what I tell aspiring Internet engineers when they come into my influence uh, is that the map is not the territory and that any model is false. And it might be useful for prediction and it might be useful for a certain amount of reasoning, uh, but it is not the truth. The, the truth is out there and you have to get out there and lay hands on it. And our thoughts about the truth can at best approximate it. And um, so I say that by way of introducing this model of uh, the innovation cycle, the revenue model of the in innovation cycle. This was told to me by an executive at Digital Equipment Corporation in 1989 and I have not found a better model. This is how I make my strategic decisions as a businessman. And it is extremely common in the commercial field. And so you should study it, not because it will be useful to you, but because it is going to help you predict the activities of all of the various innovators who are going to follow this model. So uh, those of you who know digital music understand that ADSR is actually the waveform of uh, synthesizers. Um, the difference between a piano and a guitar, even though if they're both playing the middle C sound, will be the difference in this waveform rather than the frequency. Um, but it turns out to be extremely useful for another purpose. And if you map A, the attack uh, portion of this waveform, to your time to market, and then the decay to, as your time to the first competitor, uh, the sustain, is the length of time before you have a lot of competitors and it's a, your service has become a commodity. And finally, the release, you map to the time it takes someone else to come up with a fundamentally better way of doing whatever it was that your innovation did, uh, then this is excellent, an excellent model for predicting the total lifetime revenue of some innovation investment that you would like to make. Um, so clearly, as a business matter, you should be starting your next attack sometime during the sustained period of your previous attack so that you have continuous revenue rather than one time made a lot of money and then went out of business. Uh, but besides that, this also tells us something about uh, sort of the, the QA, the quality assurance budget. 
um, because that A line, the steepness of that line, and the length of that line are the only things that are under the control of an innovator. The decay, sustain, and release are all uh, in the hands of your competitors, either your current competitors or the ones you inspire by, by building something new. And what that means is that it is uh, the smart business thing to do is to get your product out there as soon as possible with the maximum number of features that you can find a way to get out there. Um, and that's where that Saturn car came from. Uh, that's where the TCP failure came from. Uh, this is happening at scale. This, as I said, it's uh, not, there's no such thing as a perfect model, but this model does approximate the, the stories that uh, venture capitalists in Palo Alto, California are going to be hearing today uh, and tomorrow and every day thereafter. So this is why I call this a race to the bottom. Now you can do some things about this, and certainly in this audience you know how practical or impractical each of these suggestions is going to be. Uh, it turns out not very practical. Uh, but there are nation state attackers that use those sorts of problems in our infrastructure in order to attack us or in order to steal uh, or get some strategic advantage by violating privacy or, or what have you. Uh, you know, the estimate is that we're into the many hundreds of trillion, uh, billions, hundreds of billions of euros per year of wealth that are being transferred from uh, modern digitized countries into less modern uh, sort of old Soviet bloc countries or, uh, you know, the oppressive regimes here and there in the world, uh, all by uh, exercising flaws in our digital infrastructure. And we'd like that to stop because those hundreds of billions of euros represent a logistics advantage to our adversaries. And so we would very much like to do something about it. So in case you thought I was only talking about uh, commercial problems, this has some real strategic uh, national security implications. Um, so it strikes me that some countries may have earned the, uh, the uh, fire axe through some wet cable that would otherwise put them online until they're ready to behave a little better. Um, I would very much like to increase the compliance burden for device manufacturers. Um, it should be the case that before you can deliver device uh, uh, technology into the self-driving car arena, for example, uh, that you've shown that if somebody can get a, you know, uh, somehow onto the, the communications bus of your vehicle, they won't be able to suddenly spin the wheel rapidly to the left or otherwise kill you or kill a pedestrian or whatever. Uh, in other words, I'd like to see some red teaming and I'd like to see an international standards organization of some kind, could be ISO, could be uh, uh, um, Underwriters Laboratory. I don't care who it is, but I'd like to see some kind of a base standard before human life safety can be put in the hands of uh, technology that is part of a race to the bottom, please. Um, and we could also increase the compliance burden on ISPs. Uh, I've been talking to some folks at the Securities and Exchange Commission to find out if possibly source address validation could become a checklist item for auditors for public companies and they would have to disclose whether or not they practiced source address validation on their networks and whether they required their vendors to do so, uh, because this is a, uh, a rising tide that could flood all shores. This is a global problem that nobody is worrying about, and we're going to have to find some indirect ways to solve it because there is no individually rational incentive for solving it because, as I explained earlier, you just uh, make life better for your competitors. So in the military world, um, World War II would be a great example of how kinetic weapons deployed, deployed along visible borders uh, in a declared war with defined objectives, uh, concentrated capital, and uh, country uh, economies fighting economies by uh, basically saying, I believe that we can build a better logistics supply line for our army than you can for yours. Um, right? The best logistics won. And that, that's Certainly what you will read in uh, uh, Sun Chu, for example, The Art of War, 
Um, this is not a war in the same sense that the Cold War, the war on drugs, and the war on terror are not wars, even though the civilian leadership likes to call them wars. Uh, and in cyber war, we don't declare it. This is much more like uh, submarine versus submarine work that's happening in a deniable sphere so that uh, the rules are much uh, very lightly enforced because um, you can get away with anything they can't prove. Uh, it's not concentrated. It's happening everywhere. Uh, it's not kinetic. Uh, there's no border that you can defend and say, no, nope, no airplane is going to be allowed to go over from north of this line to south of that line because we have the ability to shoot them down if they do. Uh, these attacks are coming through networks that are in the ground or in the air or whatever, and uh, so the traditional military approach to stopping them isn't working. Um, and our objective here is that we don't have a defined objective that somehow we're going to end this so-called war. Rather, we would like some predictability so we know what our risks are so we can manage them. Uh, and we would like some equilibrium. We'd like to establish some line of scrimmage where we've got some of the field and they've got some of the field and uh, we at least are not living in constant fear all the time. Uh, now, what I'll say, I'm running out of time, but what I'll say is this is really quite unusual. Uh, I, as a citizen of the United States, don't really have to fear the projection of force by a foreign nation state adversary against my person or my property. I really can count on the U.S. military to make sure that no cruise missile comes out of the sky and lands on my house and, and destroys me and my family. That, that's a solved problem. On the other hand, they can project force in this sphere all day long, and not just toward me as an individual or as a public figure, but my companies or your companies. Or, uh, we are all now at risk. So we're now talking about all of the tens of billions of uh, investment dollars coming into the internet security field through Sand Hill Road and, and other investment uh, regimes in order to solve a problem that everybody now has. Every company has to defend themselves against every nation state and against every criminal empire, both foreign and domestic. That's new. It used to be that nations existed to make sure that we didn't all have to solve that problem on our own. And so uh, we are in the process now of redefining what it means to be a nation and why you might want to have one. Uh, and I don't think we were ready for that discussion. Um, so we're down to our last four minutes. I'm going to skip this uh, and just say, any questions? Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you, Paul. And now I'm sure there come some questions from the audience. There's the first one. Thank you. So about the source address validation that uh, Estonia actually does it. Uh, but uh, another thing about it is that uh, if you use the same ISP's uh, IP address, then it still can be spoofed. So is there a cure also for that? So I'm glad that Estonia does it. You're a model for the world, and I wish that you would trumpet your successes, both how little it cost and how much it benefited you, so that you might be able to create uh, a wave. Um, but yes, the, uh, the granularity of the filtering uh, directly affects its cost. So if you use egress filtering, in other words, where an internet service provider connects to the rest of the internet, to simply say, any address that isn't part of my ISP cannot pass this line, uh, then that will give some of your customers the ability to spoof the source address of others of your customers. That's a lot cheaper, however, than to give each customer their own filter. So yes, there is a very simple solution to the problem you've described, but it costs more. And given that we're already in an asymmetric situation where we have high cost and low benefit, that turns out to be a hard sell. For the next question, uh, please state your name and affiliation, please. Yes, Fernando Maimi from the Army Cyber Institute at West Point. Um, the proposals that you, um, that, that you make are politically and economically unpalatable to many. Um, and yet the work that you did to contain the effects of Comfic uh, demonstrate the potential for using uh, a force of volunteers uh, to solve problems. Can you think of any big internet problems we have that would benefit from a similar approach to being solved in the absence of policy or, or economic issues? Yes, I can. Um, 
So Dan Gear uh, works for NQTEL. Uh, gave a wonderful presentation as the keynote for Black Hat in Las Vegas earlier this year. Um, and he made a series of proposals that would uh, more or less call for a large number of volunteers in the style that you're describing. One of them is that if you are the provider of software and it's just normal commercial proprietary software and you wish to abandon it, you wish to say, sorry, no more bug fixes, that, that thing's dead. Uh, we'll give you a cheap upgrade path to something else. Uh, Dan Gear suggested that it might be a matter of national law or perhaps a trade policy that you would have to put it into open source as you abandoned it. Uh, now I ask you to consider that we have still many tens of millions of Windows XP machines. Uh, a lot of them were pirated, so Microsoft was never paid for those licenses. It's not exactly in Microsoft's best interest to go on supporting Windows XP for the next 100 years in order to get those things to be a little bit more bug-free. Um, so this might be a case where if Windows XP were placed in open source, that a large number of volunteers would be happy to go fix the problems with that. I don't think it would cut into any future revenue because Windows XP is a pig. So I think Microsoft could still sell Windows 10 in that world. But that would be an example of a, a solution along the lines you said. Last question. There in the back. Hi, um, Kenneth Gears from the NATO Cyber Center here. Uh, it sounds like you have both a deep technical understanding as well as a appreciation for military affairs. So I was wondering your thoughts and concerns on the militarization of cyberspace. I am very concerned about the militarization of cyberspace uh, because the internet is all commons. Uh, there is almost no attack that you can plan or execute that won't have uh, deleterious side effects to innocent bystanders. Um, I stood firm against a lot of the DDoS attacks that happened during uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, on the basis that, you know, this is, uh, this is not civil disobedience. You're, you're DDoSing PayPal, and there are a lot of people that would like to buy and sell things on PayPal who are not part of your movement, and they're not opposed to anything. They're ideologically aligned with you. and. Um, and that would be an example of how it is that no matter what you do on the internet, uh, it will probably have effects that you didn't know about, couldn't predict, don't intend, uh, may even regret. And I think that is especially true for military action on the internet. So I am, I am very concerned that this is not a solvable problem, but that we are going to move forward anyway. Yeah, just out of curiosity, please also allow me a question as the last one, maybe. So we, we, we learned in the early years we had IP, then we had the abstraction level of DNS to make things smoother. Now, just having learned about the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, you see there is a need maybe in the nearer future for a new abstraction level on a higher level than DNS. Maybe this also helps us to defend the nation at the borderline. Um, yes, and so... We're constantly adding abstraction layers, both software and hardware. Uh, we virtualize the old thing that used to be real and then incorporated in the new thing. So uh, we're, we've already done what you said, which is the web. Yeah. Uh, so we have an entire naming system that uses the DNS as part of it, right? You can't have a web without DNS, but it expresses the location of objects in a much more semantic way. Uh, so I think the semantic web would be an example of what you're talking about. Uh, at least as far as being an overlay that is uh, maybe more effective for this century than DNS. Um, but I don't think it will help us with our border problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And also from us, as a token of appreciation, to take back home.